I want to say thank you so much for being here, and I have a couple of people to thank for um, putting this together. The first are the five members of the CCS um, Advisory Council who have really been helping um, set the stage for this um, convening, and they are Becca Ballant, Naomi Schaefer, uh, Jen Stromstead, um, uh, Mary Wright, and Jean O'Hara, uh, who is a professor at Marlborough College. Um, and I also want to thank um, CCS fellows Susan McMahon and Jonathan Fogelson, who have also helped a great deal in setting the stage for this. And countless other individuals who have uh, answered my emails and um, uh, phone calls and met with me over the last several months, um, as well as those people who did not uh, answer my emails. Or, um, because I know it's because you're incredibly busy, and I really appreciate the work that you all do. So without further ado, I'm going to um, invite Kevin Quigley down to welcome you all. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, good evening and welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, CCS, Center for Creative Solutions, um, I, I wanted to, in welcoming you, say a few words about the partnership between Marlboro College and uh, the Center for Creative Solutions. And, and there are similarities in, in values and approach. Uh, both Marlboro College and CCS believe that, that uh, solutions to societal problems are uh, there in the community. Uh, it, they need to be participatory process. We need to think out of, out of the box and be interdisciplinary about that. Uh, I wanted to give you uh, one example. Uh, today I was there with uh, Tim Seeger and I'm not sure if there are uh, others from the Marlboro College community who were there. We had the Beautiful Minds competition, and, and this is a competition in which high school students are asked to answer the question, what is humanity? And, and their answers were incredibly creative, compelling, poignant. They, uh, one of the students uh, used Latin poetry, drawing on the works of Cotellus. Another drew on the works of the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. Another talked about the East Front Eastern Front in World War II. Another uh, uh, shared a tape of this haunting lyric version of a Estonian uh, song, all to talk about the things that make us human. And, and, and the thread that wove through all of their presentations was fundamentally to be human, you have to be connected to communities. So that's why uh, we at Marlboro are excited about this partnership. Uh, and um, thinking about this topic tonight, I'm not going to talk about Act 46, I'm new to Vermont, but I do want to talk about the issue of inequity. And, and, and that's a process, John, and you and I were talking about securitization and, and, and the, uh, the mortgage-backed industry and the impact to a generation of wealth probably uh, uh, unseen since the Gilded Age with these financial barons from Wall Street. Uh, the enormous uh, gaps in, in income across our society and really across the world. Uh, it's starting to get some attention in the national debate here. I see it uh, being talked about in other places. But when you look at solutions, there are really two things that are critical to it. The issue of education and access to the education to empower citizens to uh, have access to information that can help shape their lives, hold their governments accountable on their terms, not somebody else's terms. And that's really a tough task, and nothing more is more fundamental to that than a high-quality public education. So over the next uh, day and a half, I wish you great success uh, in your discussions. There really is nothing more important for Mont, and I think this issue of access to education and addressing inequities is, is really one of the challenges of our time. So thank you very much, and uh, good talking. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Um, so I'm just going to just set the stage here for the panel. Um, and the one thing I want to thank you in advance for is your open hearts and open minds in bringing forward this conversation um, and, and in respecting and appreciating our differences and our strengths, um, because we're going to make call forth these solutions together, all of us. 
Um, so the panel is going to introduce themselves to you just briefly. And then I have a couple of questions to set the stage. And those questions will go on for a brief period of time. The panelists are not all going to answer the same question. They're just going to answer the questions that they're most interested in. And then once that's done, we'll open it up and, and you all can ask some questions. As I said, we do need to wrap up by about 8.30. So I'll stop asking or getting questions at about 8.15. Well, hi, I, my name's Peyton, and I'm a senior at Brattleboro Union High School. I will be continuing on to college next year for, for Homeland Security and Forensic Nursing, and I'm excited to be here to offer my opinion. Hi, my name is Cassidy Walkowiak. I'm 16, and I'm from Twin Valley High School. Hi, I'm Ron Staley, Superintendent of Schools in Wyndham Southeast, Supervisor Union, Brattleboro and the surrounding towns. Um, this is the 14th year in um, that position, this position. Uh, prior to that, I was a high school principal for 12 years in two different schools. Uh, prior to that, I taught uh, social studies and English for 14 years. I was also a student council advisor and a coach. So if you add up the numbers, there's a lot of years. <laughs> uh, good evening. I'm uh, Dan French. I'm the superintendent of the Bennington Rutland Supervisor Union, which is uh, largely the Manchester area. Uh, I've been a superintendent for nine years. Uh, prior to that, I was a principal and superintendent in the Northeast Kingdom in Canaan, up on the Canadian border. Um, I am ending my career as a superintendent on June 30, and I'm going to be the coordinator of the school leadership program at St. Michael's College. Um, I also do some consulting on Act 46. Um, I'm Brad James of the Agency of Education. Um, I, my official title is Education Finance Manager. I'm not sure what that means either. Um, but what I, what I do is I, I work with the legislature a lot. I see several of you here. Um, I work with the legislature a lot. I'm the one who implements the funding law and, and pretty much everything that about the education funding law that you don't like, I probably do, um, including your tax rate, uh, along with the tax department. You're welcome. So that's what I'm here. I've worked with them when Act 46 was being implemented and written, and I've been involved with it ever since. Um, I'm Gordon Morse, or as Jordy, as some people in the community know me. I uh, graduated from Marlboro College about three years ago, and I'm currently um, in the grad school uh, down in Brattleboro for a master's in TESOL. Um, meanwhile, I'm currently um, being a TESOL teacher down in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and I have worked in the uh, Marlboro Elementary School for going on five years now, so I've generally been around the community. My name is Laura Sibilia. I'm a mom and a school board member. Uh, I'm also a regional economic development planner and a state representative. We're going to start small. Um, what is the role of public education in promoting and sustaining democracy in Vermont? <laughs> so that's kind of like the humanity question. And I probably won't do as well as those high school students did. I just think in terms of the democratic principles, um, I think for me and somebody that's been in schools really all my life, um, you know, it's, it's an issue of equity and opportunity and making sure that students have um, access to programming that gives them a chance to succeed, to do their best, to go off and to do work that they're really passionate about and be successful and, um, you know, kind of just uh, feel like uh, the work that they've put in has made a difference and that they have a chance to be very successful. The, um, I was thinking in our communities, uh, we ran an extensive community engagement process. We have, we have uh, about 11, actually more communities than that. We have 11 school boards. The, um, in all our communities, we ran an, an engagement process around uh, what is the purpose of education? And we, we distilled that information down in each community to uh, create what we call ends policies. And it was interesting that in each of the communities, basically we could distill that feedback down into three things. So across these very diverse communities, it was interesting to observe that all three of them basically had the same idea as to what students should know and be able to do. And those three things could be broken down into core academics, dispositions towards learning, things like creativity and so forth. And the last one was civic ethics. 
And, and what we talked about under civic ethics was the idea that students need to learn democracy by practicing democracy, sort of the Dewey idea that you know, school, the schoolhouse itself has to be organized in a manner that allows students to learn and practice uh, the very things that we want to see them uh, be able to do in society. I have a tendency to answer number questions in general based on my background, but since that wasn't a number question. Mm -hmm. um, in another life, I was a teacher. I was a high school teacher. And I, th and I think one of the most fundamental things that I tried to get across to them was thinking for themselves. And I think that's what education is about to a large degree. And I think that's incredibly important in a democracy such as ours. Because I think the more you think, the more you're able to, to look at different viewpoints, um, assess those viewpoints, assess, assess the, the arguments for and against, and come up with your own conclusions as to what is important and how you're going to react. And so I always told my students, it wasn't really what I'm teaching you. It's the fact that, that you're starting to think for yourselves and you're learning how to think. And I think that's really what education to me is about. So I would say um, I think education uh, and the democratic process really, um, what's, what's really important about education in that process is I was, um, I actually came from a really poor family. And so in public education, kids from all means, all walks of life come together and they're able to kind of start on the same, on the same line and hear the same information and maybe hopefully um, start thinking about the same opportunities. It's it really, I think, is an incredible <coughs> equalizer. It's probably the most important thing that we can do for our communities and for our children. So I think it's one of the most important things in democracy. None of the students want to step forward on that one? Okay, that's, that's fine. I'm not going to push. Um, so um, this one is, is sort of long. Um, as it becomes ever more important to have an advanced degree in order to succeed, what interventions do public schools need to undertake to prepare students to achieve their fullest potential? <coughs> I think with me personally, I took advantage of that question and really pushed myself to do as many science courses and all those courses as I can. And looking back, I also spoke about at another conference that I felt like students should push themselves to take classes while they have the opportunity to see if that's really what they want to do in the future before they spend all that money. And they really get that grasp before they go. And I think it's a great opportunity and a wonderful chance for them to really see that. Um, in Brattleboro, we have a pretty extensive dual credit program. Um, and one of the things that we think about is, um, especially for students first generation, in other words, they're the first in their family to think about going to college, or low income students, to give them a chance to um, experience what college level coursework is in a very supportive environment. Um, we started this program probably about nine years ago with 10 courses. We've grown every year and, and primarily because the students want it and the teachers are very excited about doing it. And we're able to partner with great institutions like Marlboro and SIT, CCV, VTC. We currently have 55 courses for next year. Um, and what, what we see is of the 300 students that are taking those courses, um, half of them are um, either first generation or low income. And when they graduate with you know, 15, in some cases, 30 credits, they're getting a leg up on college at a very affordable rate. So um, this is a program that we, we thought was important. Um, our district was used as the pilot when they did develop Act 77 in terms of, um, it's beyond dual credit now, but the, the concept of offering vouchers and, and um, scholarships for, for high school students. And um, to me, this is the way that we're gonna get kids in Vermont uh, beyond high school. These, these students that never thought of themselves as college material are really doing well. And um, that they're, they're transferring into college with you know 15 to 30 credits. And so that's a great advantage to their families as well. Um, and so I think that's really important in terms of um, allowing students to get the confidence, the support, and um, the push to, to get into um, beyond high school. 
I would just comment, um, in our system, we don't have our own high school. Uh, so we focus a lot of our work on the, the primary in K through eight. And I think uh, we talk about personalizing student learning, the idea that uh, student aspirations are really the cornerstone of getting students to achieve at higher levels and to uh, be more <coughs> successful after they leave uh, high school. So I think you know the, the redesigning education around the premise that student aspiration should be what informs the structure of the organization is going to be a key. What is the value of economic, racial, and social diversity in public education? I, I think it's learning about diverse people and diverse things. I, my father was in the Navy, uh, and so I moved, I went to 11 different schools, um, sometimes from 6th to 7th grade, but it, it was 11 different schools. And uh, there, were, there, there were all kinds of people all over the place, and I was always the new kid. Um, which is not always the easiest thing in the world, but you, but you learn to you, you you start to learn with other people and you start to develop understanding of what they're thinking and and that they're just people. Not, nothing else matters. Um, I think I think that's really what it boils down to for me. Is people are people. They come from different backgrounds. They have the same. Generally speaking, they have the same beliefs and desires at heart. And I think I think being exposed to all those things just kind of opens that up for everybody even, even more. So. Um, well, I guess I'm coming at these questions just drawing on my own experience of having been in high school not too long ago. <laughs> um, not to speak for people who are still in high school on this panel, but um, I, I, um, I did my high school and the rest of my schooling down in western Massachusetts, um, a place that's not at all unlike um, schools that I've seen in southern Vermont, but um, a little bit different. and. Uh, it was only really after I graduated that I realized that um, probably like 90% of the school was white and remembering some racial altercations, race-based altercations that happened to that school and that was kind of when I started to realize that that was really um, a thing that we need to think more about and coming up to Vermont and also realizing that <laughs> Um, Vermont is 95, 96% white right now. Um, and thinking about the question of the value of that diversity, I guess, is a question of what's the value for people who are in a school who are not white, in a school that's 95% white, and the people who are white in that school, um, because it does mean two different things. And ultimately, ultimately, we want it to mean the same thing, but the fact is we're still a long way from that, and the fact that we are still combating um, a lot of racism that has become more overt in recent years or months. <laughs> um, but I think that's a question that we need to never have leave the table. I think it needs to be right there on page one if we really want to actually make strides and not just keep going three steps forward, two steps back. Um, it's been something that I've been thinking about through college is I've been trying to look more at what I'm what I'm surrounded by and not just living in that world and not seeing it. So coming from a small school and a school in Vermont, there isn't that much diversity. Um, economic wise, there is, but um, mostly it's hard to interact with people who are very diverse. When you go to New York, for example, or elsewhere in the world, there will be more diverse states. And like growing up in a spot that's not so diverse, it's great. It's not as great because in the future you will be um, going around with more people of different diversities. So it would be better to be surrounded by more people. So in Brattleboro, um, in the surrounding towns, we do a uh, climate survey in our district, second through eighth grade students, and um, our students report that um, about 20% of our students identify themselves as students of color. And so when we look at the demographics of Vermont in general, it's, it's true that it's probably just 95% you know, white. That's not the case in our district. And um, one of the challenges we have is really attracting and recruiting teachers of color. Uh, we, we try to do a lot in terms of getting the message out. Um, you know, we have some um, plans in the future for recruiting um, trips and uh, getting information out to other 
other areas that you know this would be a great place to to come and start a career um, but that's a challenge um, one of the things that we do uh, pretty extensively is is what um, the state calls social emotional learning um, rather than just the academic learning thinking about what we call social competencies social skill development so we work with our um, upper elementary school and middle school students quite extensively um, to develop things like interpersonal skills, cultural competency, um, you know, how to get along with people, kindness. You know, uh, that, was, that was a survey question, are students kind to each other? And something like 33% of the students said no. So that's been a focus that our students have identified and it's kind of what Dan said about a democratic process where the students are looking at those results and we're saying, okay, so you develop the, the ideas and action steps that would improve your, your schools. Uh, Diana Wally is out in the audience. Diana is our um, asset development social competency coordinator. She does a great job with us working with our students and, and that has to be a focus uh, for us. Um, and so uh, again, the challenge in terms of making sure that students feel um, safe that they, um, they have these the interpersonal skills and competencies that they need, and then we need to attract more, more diverse teachers. So I would note on this, uh, on this topic, like most things, you know, our, our schools are a reflection of our communities, really. And so, um, you know, as Ron is saying, in the Brattleboro area, in this SU, there is, you know, much higher um, diversity, but, not necessarily throughout all of Wyndham County. And um, you know, looking at how do people in our communities feel comfortable. This is something with my regional economic development hat, you know, we do a lot of talking about in terms of recruitment also, um, even outside of the schools. Um, do, we have, uh, do we have places of worship that people um, would feel comfortable? Do we have um, food, places to purchase food that people want, um, these types of things. So this, I think this is a much, bigger issue than just in our schools. Um, so something that we, that we uh, I think, really need to work on. You know, it's pretty ironic how uh, much we value diversity, I think, and the, and the levels to which we have it, so. I think I'm gonna open it up to the floor uh, for questions. Hi, so I'm really curious about this idea of a level playing field. Um, and, and what that actually means for students. Because um, I also came from a really poor family. And as a student in that community, that was the level playing field. But regionally and statewide and globally, not level. So what does that really actually mean? Anybody? So for me, it meant um, some really incredible teachers, right? I mean, I think that's really what ends up being the case probably for in all of the schools, you know? I mean, teachers are the ones that are touching your kids, you know? So making sure that we have the ability um, for uh, to hire and retain incredible staff, train them, keep them, you know, professional development, um, be able to invest in them over the long term, I think that's critically important. Hi, my name is Dan MacArthur. I'm from the Marlboro School Board. Uh, I thought it was interesting the very first question had to do with democracy uh, and how do we uh, instill that into the students coming through the school system. But I have a question specifically about Act 46. Act 46, uh, a powerful case has been made by Eric Davis from Middlebury, among other people, that Act 46 completely dilutes the, the dem democratic process that we currently have in Vermont. Whereas, uh, as an example, in our town, we get together, we elect the people that we want to make up our school budgets and to hire and fire our teachers. We discuss a budget and we pass it from the floor. Uh, and uh, much of that would disappear if, <coughs> excuse me, if consolidation were to take place. The, the uh, school boards would be, there would be representatives from the town on those boards, but uh, what would be the democratic process that we, that uh, all of us here have known our entire lives in Marlboro uh, and in the, in the entire state of Vermont, how would that be affected by 
uh, jumping to much larger boards uh, in, uh, in uh, far distant places, creating the budgets, hiring and firing, et cetera. Yeah, I, think, I think it's a, a fair characterization that the, the democratic process would be diluted, um, but it's, it's really intensive right now, you know, and I think we have to adjust it um, based on, you know, the, the decline of pupils. Firstly, we have a system that really hasn't been adjusted since the 1880s, and um, we, we've had significantly fewer students. Uh, in my district, we have uh, five districts that don't operate schools. Uh, so that's that's an interesting phenomenon. I believe we have 30 some of, of those around the state. Uh, when I um, when we meet as a supervisory union board, we have 20 some odd uh, members at that table, and it's it's a really unwieldy kind of process. That it really I can't say it's it's a representative of our communities. It's really not a very functional process. And this is a group of people that work together exceedingly well. So I think yes, it's going to change, and we have to. Uh, I think the challenge is going to be to ensure that some of the values that we see as essential are preserved. And I think there are ways to preserve them. But from an operational standpoint, if we are going to achieve greater equity, if we're going to achieve greater efficiency, then we're going to have to make an adjustment in terms of the structure. The, the challenge will be, can we preserve some connectivity that we're so, so accustomed to and, and is a strong part of our culture? So I think like, things like school councils mm -hmm. and so those kinds of things are being contemplated. Um, but I, from a, where I sit in the organization looking at this system that's really, you know, designed to intervene and to be a force of, you know, democracy and equity and so forth, we can't put that larger system at risk by all these little fractured pieces. And it's a really unstable situation where, from a leadership perspective, we build capacity and then every March we get a new election and something changes. And we know in the state that about 95 percent of the school board positions go uncontested, so anyone who wants to get on a school board can get on a school board. So it's a very volatile situation every March to, to find yourself confronted with a new set of school board members and, you know, what's going to happen and so forth. So I think, I think it is something we're going to have to deal with. I, I would agree with what Dan said. Um, and sitting from my perspective, which has kind of seen more of the whole state than most people, um, I have seen that situation happen where, where there, there are groups of people working together then come an election for some, one reason or another that, that dynamic changes and it fractures. And I, I, there are districts, Marlboro is one of them where things work really smoothly. There are other districts where they don't. Um, why, I don't know, but, but they don't. And th they can vary. Sometimes they work well and then again, as I said, they can fracture. Um, you also, as Dan, Dan pointed out, there could be these, these uh, councils, I think you called them, where, that are working with the, the larger board, they're still more focused on the individual schools. This is a question I get quite a bit when I'm, when I'm out talking about Act 46. Um, but but the, the possibility of having those councils that, that are advisory, but you know, people are listening, they can't make the decision because it's truly the school board decision, which is that next higher level now. So you do lose that sense, Dan, as, as Dan said, and as you point out, it will be diluted somewhat. Will it go away entirely? No, I don't think so. However, I think, kind of going back to the, the, the level playing field um, question, that by moving things up a notch, to get it kind of out of that, that really close local thing, which I, love, I know, understand a lot of people really truly love, and I do too, but there, I, I can think of districts that are side by side within the same supervisory union, all going to the same union high school, or not, or not but, but where they get completely different offerings. Um, where, where, where one has a very robust music arts program, the other gets maybe once every two weeks. Um, I remember when I was teaching, I taught at a, I was, I was a science teacher, so good for you for teaching science, taking lots of science. Um, I remember that when I first started that school, it, six, six elementary schools fed into that Union High School. I was teaching eighth grade and ninth grade at that point. So the kids were in the school for the seventh grade for a full year. By the time I got them in my classroom, within two days, I knew what school they came from, by what they knew. And so that, that's kind of the leveling the playing field part, kind of let, let, let's get these things out to everybody so that everybody has the same chance and the same opportunity. As a legislator, um, I feel inclined to answer as a legislator, but also, also, no, I think I'll wear all my hats. So, you know, I'm not super excited about having you know a lot of assistants running the school that I'm a school board member of. 
I'm not really super excited about that. I'm, I'm not feeling probably like everybody that there's a lot of improvement to be done. Um, however, you know, I can see that that is not actually the case um, in all towns throughout Vermont. Um, I, <clears throat> we have a statewide education property tax, okay, which is supposed to pay for all of our kids to have excellent opportunities, okay? The kids that are in my school that I'm a school, that I'm a school board member of, they do have excellent educational opportunities. People do know where those kids come from. Um, as a representative, I don't think that's the case, actually, for all of the kids in all of my schools. And that's not OK. Um, I'm, I think, feeling like a lot of folks, a lot of school board members, a lot of folks in communities, this is a big change. And when there are big changes, it's really it's, it's scary. It's scary. Um, this law, when this law was being passed last year, wow, was it hard to even hear it coming through, um, to think about this concept um, and to consider it. And yet, you know, being able to actually have a little bit more of a view at a statewide level and see some of, um, some of the damage that's actually happening in some of our communities. I, I, know, that there, I know there's an opportunity to do better. And what, what I'm actually afraid of now is, I think right now we still have a chance to engage in a very democratic way with this law and be creative. I do think we've got a lot of opportunity now in Wyndham County um, in, and in Southern Vermont. And in Wyndham County and Southern Vermont, I think a lot of education officials, we'll see if Brad agrees, have acknowledged that mm, might be a little trickier here than in some other places. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think there are opportunities for us to make this work in a way that works for us and for our students and for our communities. Uh, it's challenging. It's challenging, you know, with these remote, you know, communities, it can be challenging. But I, I think there are opportunities for us. Could I address that and then we can take other questions? You know, I, I think of our district as a pretty well-functioning supervisor union. And so when, when Act 46 came along, we knew, okay, we have to form a study committee or start looking at things. And quite frankly, what it, what it caused us to do is, is look at our programs. Um, we did a whole program overview, cost per students, programs in place at each school, student achievement, um, pov poverty percentages, and that sort of thing. And, and what we recognize is the lack of equity within our system. Um, and I, and I understand what you're saying about town meeting, representation, local control. But you know, I work with small districts every year trying to develop budgets, and they don't have much local control. They have the staffing, which is 80% of their programming. Um, we try to institute programs that the other schools are able to do because they have a larger, larger student population. Um, the per pupil expense doesn't have such a dramatic impact on their schools. But when we try to institute these programs, it, it causes the percentages to go up, it causes the taxes to go up, and the school boards are saying, and, and I'm saying, you know, this community can't afford this type of increase. So what it's caused us to do is, is think about, okay, so if we were able to spread those costs across 2,500 students as opposed to 120 students in a school, we're able to um, really expand opportunities for students. And, and that's the key for me, the lack of equity. Um, Dan mentioned the school-based councils. We, we're, we're really stressing that in terms of the representative of the union board being there with the principal, staff members, community members. Um, they don't have the same authority as a school board, but quite frankly, they're gonna advocate for their schools just like any school board would. Um, and, and, you know, working in a system now that has a union high school board, you know, we have representatives from all our towns. Uh, it's a well-functioning board. It's really looking out for all of the kids. That's how I would see this, this unified union board working. Um, and so, yeah, there are challenges, and in, in the, the whole idea of giving up town meeting is an issue, clearly. Felicity, does everybody know what Act 46 is? Could they give us a succinct explanation? Uh, of what Act 46 is really about and what it's doing. 
Um, the, the legislature recognized that things were not particularly equitable throughout the state. A lot of small schools are in quite a bit of trouble. We all tend to like small schools, me included. Um, the, the equity issue is pretty paramount. Um, and what Act 46 was an attempt to do was to try to structure, as Dan and, and, and uh, Ron just said, try to structure a way to get people to start, get people being school districts and supervising, start moving towards larger districts where you can spread some of these costs, that you can give more opportunities, you can move teachers around between school districts, which you can't do under um, the current system. And, and so the idea behind it was to, to start this process moving forward, give people lots of time to think about it. I know not everybody thinks it's lots of time, but give people lots of time to think about it. There is a stick at the end. Um, the stick at the end is that the, the secretary comes up with a recommendation as to what she thinks is happening based on what she thinks is gonna be happening on a certain date and makes recommendations as to whether people should join and merge together if it makes sense or not. Um, and at the end, the State Board of Education has the authority to make those, to do what they want. They can throw her, assuming it's still her, they can throw her recommendation out completely. They can take it, they can change it, they can do what they want. It's, 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 their, it's their call at the end of the game. So that, that's kind of the stick at the end. However, with this period that we're in right now, working up to it, it has, and I've, I've heard this from, from a number of administrators and school board members, it has kind of precipitated a conversation that has needed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it's, so it, w one of the things that Act 46 is, is doing is it, it is getting this conversation started. There, and I've been stunned by how much good conversation has been going on so far in less than a year. I'm truly stunned. Um, we've, we've had... They, they were the easy ones, I will say that. We've had six, seven, eight mergers go through already through, through, through the popular vote and have now passed their reconsideration period, so they're, so they're, they're, they're official. Um, I, nobody expected that. We expected three or four and out of the easy ones. And it's just, you know, people are really talking and people are working hard, especially in this area and other areas. People, people are having some very serious, very thoughtful conversations and they're not all easy. And, it, and it's not going to work everywhere. In some cases, I think what's going to happen is things are going to look exactly like they look now. But I think in other parts of the state, people are going to figure out ways to do things better. They're going to really help their students. And that, that's really what it's about. It's really about improving the opportunities for the kids. Um, so I'm uh, David Major. I'm chair of the Westminster uh, School Board. And uh, I'm also on the, the uh, Act 46 Consolidation Committee for the Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union District. Um, <clears throat> and I, um, and, and just to say a little bit more about Act 46, it was passed a year ago. It um, is, has substantial incentives uh, to school districts that give up, the towns that give up their school boards in favor of one school board that oversees a group of towns um, and, uh, and, and uh, administers those, uh, the, all of the schools in that, that group of towns. For instance, uh, if all of the towns in the Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union uh, vote for it, uh, Westminster will give up its school board, Rockingham will give up its school board, Athens will give up its school board, Grafton will give up its school board, and there would be one school board, and potentially the, the Union High School would give up its school board, and there would be one board overseeing all of the uh, schools, the students uh, in that four town area. Um, similar in, in the southeast district and, and around the state. However, you also have a choice of, um, uh, in a town, of, of linking up with other towns, according to the law, Act 46, of linking up with other towns um, who have the same educational structure as, as your town has. Um, we, in our last uh, uh, Act 46 consolidation meeting, which was on Wednesday, we talked about the towns, the other towns in the state that have the same uh, uh, educational structure as Westminster and Athens and Grafton, all of which have uh, schools for uh, uh, grades pre-K through six, 
and then there's school choice for grades seven and eight, and then there's a union high school after that. Well, uh, we were told at that meeting, the only other two towns that exactly match uh, the, the, the educational structure uh, uh, that we have in our area are, or in our town, are um, J West and Newport. West and Newport town. And um, uh, I took that information back to my mother, who was taught kindergarten for 35 years in the town of Westminster. And she said, that sounds great. We'll get a whole lot more snow days. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but uh, um, seriously, I have a lot of concerns about uh, this because Act 46, uh, to me, uh, reduces the, the citizen engagement and en enfranchisement and empowering of our, our people of the citizens. And um, I, um, you know, I, I want to go through the process. I see, want to see what works. Uh, but I, I value democracy. I value small democracy. Democracy is messy. It's inefficient. It's expensive. And we would do much better to have one you know, one uh, dictator across the whole country if we care to. And uh, it's a lot more efficient. But we have a pretty good thing going right now. In the town of Westminster, every town meeting, we get hundreds of people coming. We have, excuse me, I should have a question. Yes. <laughs> um, I, sorry for going on. Um, my question is this. Uh, when I was a... Um, when I was a young adult, I started a business um, uh, that was uh, making milking equipment for dairy sheep and dairy goats. And I linked, I, I went to my neighbor and said, let's do this business together. And so he and I went to a business consultant. And the business consultant said, you are not going to do a business together. You, David, have a marketing and design thing going. You've designed this, and that is your, that's your power. That's where you're at. You, John, have a metalworking company. You don't want to give up your control to, to uh, some other entity. You want to have a, an agreement to work together. I think we would be much better off not to give up our, our uh, small democracies in our individual towns and instead use the opportunity of Act 46 to try to uh, work on cooperating together better and not, not giving up our town meeting control over our, our uh, kids' education. So I would like to know your uh, reaction to those sentiments. Thanks. So, I, I mean, it's my sense that with that your articles of agreement that folks are contemplating, <coughs> considering, I mean, those are agreements to work together. It's also my sense that there is a tremendous amount of latitude given right now in developing those. I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not aware if the, that they're extremely, you know, uh, restricted. You know, and, and with regard, I, I always think every problem is solvable, right? So the town meeting, the town meeting problem, I think that's a solvable problem. You know, I mean, I think your first, I, I think, who was telling, who suggested, um, I might have been my school board chair, some, someone suggested, I think the first meeting of these, um, of these, you could agree it has to be at a town meeting. You know the first the first budgets that are passed and this sort of thing and and then determined from then on out how the meetings would happen you know I mean I think there are creative things that can be done I really do and again you know I don't I don't really look forward to having any assistance running running the school that I am a school board member for I don't look forward to it um, but we have for folk for folks that don't remember or know or understand we, the statewide property tax that came in uh, with Act 60, Act 68, it was really based on equity, okay? There was inequity, like there is now, 
throughout the state, okay? And lawsuit and determination, you know, we all are responsible for making sure that all of the kids have equitable education opportunities, you know? And a system was devised. I you know I certainly had some, you know, issues with the system over, over a long period of time, but our constitution says equity, lawsuits have said equity. We've got a funding system that we all pay into, okay? We all pay into. And so there's no means actually. I love the small town, you know? I love doing our own thing, you know? But there's no means of being accountable to each other with regard to the statewide education property tax. Okay, which is something that we all own together. So we all own the money that's going in to pay for our kids. And then we individually are going off and doing the best that we can do. And I don't actually think that that meets equity in our constitution. I, I mean, I think we see that throughout the state, you know, and particularly in our smaller high schools, you know. I really feel that angst myself, I mean, I'm a long time small school board member. Brad knows I have been fighting for small schools for a long time, okay? But it's not fair, actually. It's just not fair. We're all paying for some kids to have really great education opportunities and some kids not. It's not fair. And you know, how can we do better? And I think it's really uncomfortable, the situation that we have right now, because we actually do have a lot of latitude although we are starting to run out of time and we are in a tricky area. And so that is what has me a little concerned. So I think I've said enough there. Okay, so have a lot of creativity that the elephant in the room, at least with the, the three districts, Wyndham Southeast, Wyndham Northeast, and then Windsor right above us, is that you have choice, towns with tuitioning and towns without tuitioning. And you do have, we have no latitude on that. There, we, not, we can't be creative. We're not allowed to have choice towns and non-choice towns in the same district. And so this law is pitting towns against towns. Vernon, Marlboro, Westminster, Athens are being pitted, and we do not have the option of existing in the same consolidated district according to the State Board of Education. So I'm going to give this over to the Agency of Education in one second, okay? As a state representative, okay, I represent six and a half towns, okay? And the six of my six and a half towns all have choice, and it is all exceptionally important to them, okay? All of the towns in our state, which is an equity state, which means equitable opportunities for all students in our state, do not have choice, okay? So in my two SUs, which have a lot of choice in them, I see a number of opportunities to come together creatively and preserve choice. And so I want to caution people very much in our state, which is based on equity for every student around this argument. Just to, just to clarify, so if people could get identified rather than shooting out questions in the, in the future, that'd be more helpful. Go ahead. Okay, I just, I just want to say a few things about Act 46 itself. Having listened, I think Laura did a very nice explanation of the equity issue that, that Act 60 was intended to address, which it did to a large degree. There's a huge amount of misinformation out about Act 46. Um, some of it's intentional, and lots of it's not intentional. Um, it is confusing, and most people have not read the law, and if you read the law, you will probably be more confused. Um, but what Act, 60, uh, what Act 46 does not say, it does not say that you have to merge. That is not, it, pe people say we have to merge. No, you don't. Act 60, or um, pardon me now, if you got me on Act 60. <laughs> uh, several later. Um, Act, Act 46 is saying that this is one possible path. One of the things that Act 46 is trying to do, though, is to get districts to talk and, and start looking at how they can do things more efficiently and more beneficially for the kids. And I think you pointed out yourself that even though you're against Act 46, which is perfectly fine, with the conversations that are happening are valuable. And those conversations were not necessarily happening before, as Laura pointed out. And I think that's one of the things that Act 46 has done. Again, as I said, it doesn't say that, that you have to merge. People think it does. It does not say that. It says if it makes sense to do it and you choose to do it, go ahead. Yes, the state board can say you're going to do it at the end. Whether that really happens or not, I have no clue. I can't, I can't talk for the state board. 
but again, going to your issue with, with the districts around here, up, up in Wyndham um, Northeast, the state cannot say you have to combine into a single district because the law clearly says the state can't do that because you're not operating the same way, so therefore you can't do it. And so, as I said earlier on, Act 46 recognizes that this will not work everywhere, and it's not intended to work everywhere. But it is intended to get people to start having these discussions and to start looking at what can possibly happen and to put the kids first and start thinking about what the kids can need and what they're going to be getting from all these things. So, I'm Deborah Luskin. I'm from Newfane, the Wyndham Central uh, Supervisory Union. I am the town moderator, the school moderator, and the Newbrook Elementary School moderator. And um, I really want to get back to talking about fractured democracy, as if that weren't already a good introduction to it. Um, so it's really heartening to hear everybody talk about equity in education and the wonderful education people aspire to. But let's talk about the taxpayers, because those are the people who come to my meetings, or the meetings that I am their moderator for. And already, the funding mechanism is phenomenally complicated, and there are five elements of it, and when we vote only on one, only on the budget, everything else is out of our control. So taxpayers have a great deal of frustration and they're very much, in, in, in the meetings that I moderate, people are very much in favor of reducing taxes um, and also very much in favor of education. And in fact, Newbrook is already a joint school district. And in addition to savings, we have improved educational opportunities for our kids. We can actually field an entire team with two grades. They have to play somebody else, though. <laughs> so, so my question is really, how does Act 46 get taxed? And my concerns about democracy are about civic engagement. If we want our schools to be the center of our communities, how do we do that if our communities are not our tax base? For instance, we had a Leland and Gray school district budget, a $7 million budget, 90 of the 1,500 registered voters in my town voted. Uh, and then we had a school meeting for the Newbrook Elementary School, that's two towns, 1,500 from Newfane, and about, I can't remember if it's 300 or 600 voters in Brookline, and we had 15 people vote on a $2.2 million budget. Uh, so what is Act 46 gonna look like from the taxpayers and the revenue and the deliberative point of view? So, let's see, I'm trying to go back to all the questions that were in there. Um, Not much is going to change in terms of how tax rates are calculated. Tax rates, the simplistic way of looking at it is tax rates are based on what you're spending per pupil. The more you spend, the higher your homestead tax rate. The lower you spend, the lower your homestead tax rate. I, that, that's not going to change. What is going to change is how much you're spending, because you now have a larger population base, assuming we have a merger of some sort. You have a larger population base, and so you now have more kids. So the, the idea behind the financial side of Act 46 is that a larger entity is able to make better spending, not, I shouldn't say better spending decisions, that's not correct, more efficient spending decisions because, because of the size to a, to a large degree. They also have the ability to, to shift teachers around, to move, to move teachers so that the classrooms are, are more the same size and everything. So I think, and, and these guys can speak to this better than I can, because this is their world, not mine. I think that, that there are overall efficiencies that will start cropping up in a lot of these areas and where, where these merges are going forward. Going back to something that Laura said, the funding system is a state system. What I do up in my town affects you. What you do down here affects me up in my town. And, and that's the, because it's a statewide system. And 
if people don't understand that it's a statewide system, and that people think, oh, well, this isn't really affecting me, I, I can spend more money, it is affecting you, but it's also affecting everybody else in the state. So pe people are getting caught up in here. One of the things that's happening is, as I said, Act, si Act, Act 4, 60, what, 68, 146, whatever number we're on, um, it's actually 148, um, is based on a spending per pupil cost. What's been happening in Vermont is, as these gentlemen said, was the population's going down, and it's going down fairly significantly. Unfortunately, the cost is not going down along with it, because when you lose kids, you might lose three or four kids in your school district, in a small school district, that's a big proportion, but that doesn't mean you can cut a teacher. It doesn't mean you can cut some ancillary staff, because it's, it's not a nice gradual slope like the, the loss of students. It's more of a step function where you're going along and suddenly, okay, now we've hit that mass where we can cut and down, we're down here. And that's where people are, and that's why a lot of small schools are having trouble right now because they are losing kids and their tax rates are going up and people are getting angry and they are coming back after the school boards to cut the budgets and, and make things more equitable for everyone with lower tax rates and it's hurting the kids because they can't give the kids what the kids need. If you can spread those costs out over a larger body, then you get more stability and it also improves the small schools themselves. It gives them a better chance to be viable than what they're having right now. I think I missed half your questions because I went off on my own tangent there. So did I get the majority? Oh, how is it taxed? Yeah. Okay. I mean, what, what's the new group that votes? Who, who votes? Okay, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it, it, it's, like it's, 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 the new, it's the new entity. If we were to take this, this um, supervisory unit right here, assuming it all went through and it became a single school district, it would be everybody in these one, two, three, four, five towns? Mm -hmm. Five towns voting all at once on, on a budget. Okay, th that, that's how it would work. And then that would develop a tax rate. Everybody, all the five towns would have the same tax rate. Now we're getting into the geek world of Brad. Um, it, would be, it would be the equalized tax rate, but it's adjusted by the CLA, the Common Level Appraisal. We, I know you know that. <laughs> um, and so everybody have a slight different tax rate, but it's based on the same spending level. So it's essentially the same tax rate. So all that money then is, again, same way it is being done now, is raised by the towns. I send out the cash flow sheet saying, here, you've raised this money from the homestead side, you've raised this amount of money from the non-residential side, and I tell you where to send it. It'll be easier for me because it all goes to one school district. This is not about me, though. But it all goes to one school district. I know it looks like it's about me, but it's not. Um, it's, it's, but it all goes to one, the, the one school district instead of splitting it up between, say, Wyndham and Leland and Gray or something like that, which, which is what we have to do now. So it simplifies it for everybody in that sense. But, and, but, but the overall structure of how, the, how the, the taxes is working doesn't really change. It's just a, it's a larger body vote, voting on one budget. Could, could I just follow up with the Newburgh um, situation? So I worked in Wyndham Central for nine years. And um, when I was leaving, uh, Brookline was probably 30 students. Um, New Fane probably had 100 and, I don't know, 10, 20 students. Um, to me, that's a great example of like a side-by-side -side merger. Um, Brookline was not going to survive. Um, they were trying to do everything they could to keep Brookline. Um, their taxes were very high. Um, the opportunities were very limited for their students. And, and what I can see is the, the benefits of the student opportunities by having those two schools combined. I'm pretty certain the tax rates were, were very good compared to what they were. Um, now, I don't know how that's continued on, but certainly when it was Brookline and Newfane separate, the Brookline tax rate was, was like just going up, up quite a bit. So from my perspective, the student opportunities was a, was a real benefit. Um, and so, you know, when, when we think about mergers in Act 46, um, you know, is it realistic to merge with Newport? Of course not. But there are like towns, and, you know, we have schools that are K-6, K-8. You know, there's no reason why side-by-sides can't happen with some of those schools. So, um, I mean, I think people have said you, you can be creative. Um, you know, Newfane, Newbrook, they have a town meeting. Uh, Brookline and Newfane people come together to vote on that budget. Yeah, well that's, you know, 
like the Union High School Board that we have, our, our budget, you know, we have so many taxpayers, but, you know, maybe 100, 200 people come to vote. Um, that's, you know, I, I think we have to do a better job getting people, you know, to be involved in their civic duty. Um, but. Um, yeah, uh, Douglas Corb, uh, Marlboro School Board member. Um, I just have a question which is more related to, I guess, the financing part of it. Um, I, th I don't think, while I understand Act 46 and the point of it, it's, it's, it's pretty clear when you put things on the PowerPoint that more people paying into the system provides more opportunities and more money. But when you spread that out, uh, I don't think much thought was given to the more rural areas like people like Marlboro. I mean, there's Windham in our supervisory union. Also, there's several others. But we, in particular, were the only K through eight. So when you look at the money in Wyndham, where you have a lot of like districts, and you know, I always hear, oh, we've had six people come together and vote, and it's great, and it's, it's really easy. But for us, it's, it's not so easy. And so there's a lot of incentives being thrown at these people. But also, I tend to disagree a little bit with Mr. James, because though Act 46 doesn't force you to merge, uh, what was the way it was put to me by our exploratory committee is that there are great pressures too and one of them is we will lose funding uh, you'll take away the ADM hold harmless um, which basically then it, to me just reappropriates funds somewhere else that's you know so I don't understand the equity in that uh, and then I also don't understand the small schools grants too if we can't get our act together fast enough and find a partner because that's pretty much what's happening now is that nobody you know we call them dance partners we don't have a dance partner right now and so if we don't get that together by a certain deadline, then the small schools grants goes away. And so that, to me, immediately takes away programming. So even if we put in a proposal to stay the same, we're still changing. So how do you, how do you respond to that? Yes, I okay. So, and you and I also talk all the time, so, and I'm gonna give this right over to Brad and let him speak, but I, as a legislator, I will say to you, I think that this process is more than a two-year process and I think that we will probably see some changes next year. I think there have been very few changes this year, really looking to see how things um, are, are rolling out, um, give things a chance to get some steam. So my sense is you're likely to see either some extensions or changes or assistance or better understanding of problems and so new solutions. So. And I, I would actually echo that um, because I was involved in, in the committee discussions both on the House and the Senate side when this was being written and it was really the Senate bill that kind of ended up coming out and it actually had another year in it to begin with before, before the, the deadline. And for a variety of reasons it got pushed, they wanted to push it, some people wanted to push it back two years and they compromised on losing one year as opposed to two years. Um, I would not be surprised to see, as Laura said, that, that there is some type of extension coming out next year. I think it was very deliberate this year to leave it alone as much as possible because it does seem to be working to a large degree in a lot of places. It is generating lots of conversations. Um, going to some of your points, um, the ADM hold harmless is, you're right, it's reapportioning money. And right now, if you have the phantom pupils, then your tax rate is artificially lower, which means that other people in the state are paying for your kids. It's, it, 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 it is a statewide system, yes, but your tax rate is now artificially lower for no real reason, outside the fact that your population dropped and there's a piece of language in it that covers that. And that means that if I don't have phantom students in my kids because your tax rate's lower, you're not bringing as much money, that means I you know, make it a simplistic system, I have to pay more money. So there's, there's an inequity right there. Same thing can be said about small schools grants. I'm a big supporter of small schools. I happen to like them. The small schools grant, though, is paid by everybody else. And the, the small schools are the recipients of it. So that's a policy decision. We have, we have some of these small schools that are getting so small that they're, they're truly becoming ineffective. And it sounds like Brookline was one. In fact, I know it was. And I, I could probably name 10 others off the top of my head. Um, and so part of what's keeping them going somewhat artificially are the small school grants because that's lowering the tax rate. Who's paying the, for that? Everybody else in the state. So th there, there are these things that are happening that, 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 that benefit some people, but somebody's paying for it. It's kind of a zero-sum game when you talk about either pupils or you talk about money and things like that. It, it, you know, it's, if you move it here, then it goes there, but the level stays the same.
it, there's not new new money being thrown or anything like that. Um, are you being forced to do this to a degree somewhat? Yes, because there is that stick in the background. But again, by the same token, um, there's also there are also provisions in there saying where it where it's appropriate. And if it's not necessarily appropriate, or if you can show that you're doing a really pr good job the way you currently ex exist, or in some other slightly different structure, whatever, you have that opportunity to make the case. Again, I can't speak for the state board. I have no idea what they'll do. I don't even know who will be on it at that point. But, but that's, that's, that's where it sits. But, but districts are allowed. My district is adamantly opposed to joining with its neighboring district. We, we are exactly the same in terms of structure. But my district doesn't want to lose control of its budget, which, which to me, and I've and I've said this at a school board meeting, um, which which to me is saying that you're saying that the parents of the other district don't care as much as we do, and I don't buy that argument. And I th and I think, and this is a lot of questions all at once, and we're coming back to. I think I think the. Um, the issue of, about about kind of watering down democracy is is valid valid argument a valid point I, I don't necessarily disagree with it but I also think it takes away from the fact that that these are not just your kids they're going to be everybody's kids and everybody cares and everybody should care yeah, I'm sorry. I don't follow up again, but no it's okay I just mean like the money that's coming from these for these incentives coming from the general ed fund is it not um, so if we can't get on this timeline and do the merger in accordance with that, we lose the incentives, which essentially is, you know, supposed to be everybody's sort of pot, is it not? I mean, so how is it not taking away from people that are just sort of disenfranchised because of their structure and their geography? I, I see your question. Yep. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. The, the incentives are paid for out of the, out of the, out of the general pot. Okay, just exactly like I was talking about small schools, grants, and the phantom pupils, et cetera. It's out, it's out of the same pot. Um, a district that is receiving incentives, though, is, again, as I said, is bringing in less money to the Ed Fund. Okay, that means everybody else th 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 has, to, has to raise more, including them. So they're actually helping to pay for their own incentives. They're, in other words, you, know, you, read, you read 8 cents off, 10 cents off, whatever. If it's 10 cents off, it's really not. Because, because they're not bringing that money to the education fund. The base has to go up to bring enough money to the education fund. That affects everybody, including them. So those people getting incentives are helping to pay for their own incentives. Yes, they're still getting a break. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying they're not. They, they are. They're still, they're still getting a break. Um, what was your other point? You had another one. Well, just the fact that you know, people that can't get the break because, <laughs> because of geography or yeah. location or yeah. structure, right. all those things that keep from merging fast on this accelerating track, mm -hmm. it just there's, right. you know. and and that and that I will stop talking. I in would a just I would just say you also benefit from the from the savings though. Th the that's districts what I was are merging. You know they're generating savings. Like our district, we formed a red and we helped dissolve another supervisory union as a result of that. Those are savings that are felt by the whole system, not just mm -hmm. by us. And, so and can I can I just step in here because we're 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 getting close to the to the end time, and I feel a little bit like we're getting Sorry. into some some serious details, which might be losing some of the other people. Um, so I guess I I'm, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and and refocus the conversation to the students at the table, because um, I think it would be valuable to hear and get back to this sort of general question. And I guess I'll use it as a moment of prefacing tomorrow's conversation, which is around thinking about. Um, how to define equity. We've used equity a lot today, but it's never been defined, and it, and it also is not defined in the law. And I think since the communities ultimately vote on these things, I think it's really important for the community to participate in a conversation around what the definition of equity is. So I guess with that preface, I'm gonna, so I, I hope you all stick with us and come tomorrow morning starting at 9 at the grad school. Um, and I want to just see whether or not the students have... Um, in, I, I, I guess I'm interested, and I'm not going to put you on the spot so you can say I don't want to answer this, but in relationship to what's happened here um, in these conversations, what is your sense of sort of what, what, where we need to go in order to preserve democracy and to preserve opportunity for students in, our, in the public school system? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. What works for? Yeah. Um, what are the things that we should preserve in the midst of all this yeah. adult discussion? 
I would say after listening to all the conversations that have been going on about the different acts, I was not, um, I didn't know much about the acts before coming here or the act that was talked about a lot today and I feel like there was a lot of different opinions on it where I could see the side of what the people on the panel were saying and where like I can see like, oh, the, the smaller districts, they're not going to have as strong as a voice anymore. And I'm definitely one for smaller districts having like their own voice because that's their area instead of like combining. I would think with schools in general, for the students, I would definitely add in more student voice. Um, maybe definitely some of the younger freshmen and sophomores who are just coming in, maybe even eighth grade, depending on what they see, getting more of their opinion on how they would want to see their classes, how they want, maybe get their voices heard on some of these new um, committees that are being formed, just so that the diversity is more well-rounded, if that makes sense. Do you have something? Um, <laughs> well, it's a very big topic, as we all know. Um, what I got out of it was there is a lot going on with the merger and how it may or may not be all about the e e equity, sorry. Um, but it does help, I would feel, because even our school, the DVES, they combined in order to make everything better. Um, so I feel like more mergers would create better, um, better school. What's better? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Well, the education and like hiring and all, because like it's really hard to hire teachers right now, especially since like we even need to hire a new person right now, um, but we're delayed on that, and it's hard to get enough teachers, especially in a small, uh, in a small town. But when it when everything is bigger, it might be easier to get uh, more qualified teachers and just help everyone come together in that kind of way. Is that answered? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I count as a student as well. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know, just trying to make sense of everything I've heard tonight. Um, I'm trying to look for a common theme, and just from what I've heard, it's, it's you know, kind of the first time I've thought about a lot of this at this level, but it keeps coming back to a theme of caring about the students that we don't consider ours. Like, we consider the students in our district our kids. You know, we know them. We we know their parents, we know, you know everyone in their community, but we don't necessarily know the kids in the next community over. We don't know the kids in the next district over, but all of a sudden, it seems like people are getting connected, suddenly, whether they like it or not, to these other people that they don't know very well. And maybe the only thing they know about them is like, you know, oh, that district has some weird tax thing. Oh, that district you know, has this about its school that I don't really understand, I don't really know. And I think that's what kind of sometimes breeds fear about is like if we if 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 we if our good thing that we built here you know we built this we built this thing for our kids all of a sudden we get chained to this other school and all of a sudden our money is going filtering towards this thing that we don't know about we didn't build you know we don't know what's going on I think that's a very understandable fear I know I would I I, I would be worried about that if I you know if I had kids and I was in that position um, and so I think. At least from what I'm from what I'm thinking about right now is there needs to be an awareness and a care that needs to start to happen if this if this Act 46 and this the all the implications that are going to go along with it all the all the messy details that people have been bringing up during this evening are actually going to get resolved in a in a useful and understandable way. I think that we need to really get more people involved in kind of you know. You know, like, like someone said, there's only like 15 people voting on a huge budget. And, you know, shake people in your community being like, listen, you know, if, if this is happening, we need to start looking at these people who are beyond us, who are suddenly going to start to be very important to us, and where our tax money is going to start funneling and there's gonna, their money's going to start coming towards us. We need to start thinking a little bit bigger than we have been, I think. Um, and I think that's something we need to start talking about with each other, our neighbors, and our neighbors' neighbors, and, you know, the people not just down the street, the people in the next district over. And I think that needs to start happening. Ideally, it was supposed to start happening before our taxes started getting affected by these laws. Um, and I really hope that something will happen to make this conversation start happening at a much more rapid pace. That's my thoughts on the matter. So uh, one last question up here. This is the last one. Not a question. <laughs> Surprisingly. We haven't talked about a part of Act 46, and that was the cost containment part. No one has raised that question here tonight at all, and it goes directly to the property tax issue that all of us at every one of our town meetings talks about. 
there was a distance, the uh, cost containment frame that was in Act 46 for the first time had every school district in the state had to stay within a certain threshold. Whether you agreed to what that was or wasn't is not the point. We have, pr prior to that, we had picked a point on the per pupil spending, and everybody who was above that got a penalty, and everybody below that got to keep spending. So this takes the whole thing, moving it right on up, and it's been going on like that since the beginning of Act 60. So we had a very innovative way to actually bring some level of cost containment for um, taxpayers in Act 46. And interestingly enough, that's not been part of the conversation here tonight. What happened with that was the Senate was very opposed to that. They wanted no cost containment. This was a House proposal, and it passed in the House bill. Um, and so when the issues came up this year, um, the Senate ended up winning, and we went back to now, we are back to the original cost containment, which picks a point in statewide spending. So I have to ask a question here, I know. And I'm going to do that. Do I have to? <laughs> yes, Ann, you do. <laughs> My name is Ann Manwaring. I'm the state representative for Wilmington, Whitingham, and Halifax. Um, and I serve on this, the House Education Committee. And I spent six years on appropriations. And I got, um, I won't go into that part of it right now. So, but I'm curious from all of you folks up there about if you're going to do a cost containment system as part of our whole financing system, does it make more sense to have everybody in the game or just to pick these points? Because I will tell you that the people who were penalized over the whole time frame are largely small schools because of the economy of scale. So I would love to have your opinions about whether or not we should broaden the cost containment frame or throw it out altogether, which is what the Senate wanted to do. I, so not that you and I have talked hours upon hours on this, but I would just say, and I don't think we can, with the time that's left, um, talk about um, the tax issue, tax ex equity, you know, the whole financing equity. I would say, um, and I might not have agreement at this table, um, the way the system works right now, I don't believe it actually does provide financial equity. Um, this Act 46 will help um, get better financial equity, therefore allowing more equitable opportunity to be purchased for students. Um, but I absolutely think we need to be looking at having everybody in the game and, you know, you and I, you and I tried this week to <laughs> get something like that going back again and unsuccessfully, so. I'll, I'll make a, <laughs> okay. before Brad explains it in greater, I'll just say that um, I thought the approach was half-baked um, in that it was produced at the last minute. So we. You know, we have these large enterprises that, um, given enough time, we could have reacted to that, you know, appropriately. But I think that was passed on a Saturday evening in May, and our budgets were well on the tracks for the following year. So, I mean, you know, to really to give us a chance to even react to that without really getting into some draconian reactionary kind of cuts, we need to have plenty of time to do that. And I think, in fairness to, to us that are in the school boards that juggle with that, we you know, we were faced with the entire content of Act 46, contemplating what the, the other side of it was going to be about, to also face those caps in really a six-month time frame. When we had just passed the budget that really was going to be the basis of how we were going to be compared, uh, really was an unfair approach. But I, I agree, some, you know, that near-term approach needs to be tweaked a little bit more, um, and I'm, I'm hoping we can come up with something that's a little more, uh, more effective than the, uh, the old one. Um, I, I, tend, I tend to agree with what Dan said. It was, it was definitely a last minute thing that was thrown in. I, I saw it the night before at 10.30 and reviewed it and said, yeah, it works, but it hasn't been thought through. Um, and as Dan said, it was kind of thrown on thing, on, onto to a situation where it's already moving. What I liked about it is what you liked about it is that everybody had their own target. And, and, I, and I, I truly support that. I, th I think if we're going to do any type of cost containment, each school district should have its own, 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 for, own um, target, pardon me. However, this was a little heavy-handed because 
it was just an, it was just a number. It was not based on anything. And I think the thing to do with something like this is to look at some of the parameters and, and the facts that are, that are driving some of these changes throughout the school systems and look at them over a period of two or three years for each individual district, which I, I can do. Um, <laughs> um, and and, uh, and, and, to, and just to develop something that, that is more real and robust as opposed to just here, here's the highest one, so it's based on the highest, which is what it was based on, and that and that made the, and no, no, the one, the one, the, the one that was passed in Act 46 is based on the highest spending in the state, and and that made no sense, and it it was it was an arbitrary target, and, and I think that's part of the outcry, plus the fact that it was dropped on folks at the last minute when they are already into their budgets, and, and so that was if you, if you recall that that uh, legislative hearing back in mid November when I first started talking about this, one when I first started getting myself in trouble again um, one of one of the things that I did say was to, to if you're going to do this hold off one year and and that was why I think I articulated that a little bit at that point um, I don't I'm not opposed to to some type of cost containment but again it said I do strongly support the fact that that it should be based on each individual school district if you go into Bill Talbot Bill Talbot's my boss my direct boss um, if you go into Bill, he's the deputy secretary, I guess I should tell people that. Um, if you go into his office on his whiteboard are things that he and I are trying to work on, we can't find the time to sit down and do it. Um, and we, we understand we need to do it, but we just can't find the time. We're trying. So I think we actually have to wrap up, right? Um, so I just want to say I hope you all will come tomorrow morning where there will be more, much more opportunity for you to speak um, and, uh, and to work through a facilitated process in which we try to define excellence and equity. And I got, get the sense that in fact whatever we come up with will have a place to go with the legislature if in fact they're continuing to talk about um, changes that might be made to education laws in the future. So, so please come and thank you very much and thank the panelists very much for being here.